It's been more than a year now since I jumped ship from Canon and purchased my A7S II after a disappointing 5D Mark IV launch. The promises of things like S-Log and the full K full frame were just too hard to resist. But after a year and some months later, I'm still questioning myself every time I use it. What picture profile should I be using for what situation? Is S-Log really the best option for everything? Is it more noisy at a base size of 1600? Why are there four Cinegammas? when they all look the same. Well, today I find out just what the differences are in a real-world application. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit about dynamic range. If you're already an expert at this, well, my bad. Dynamic range in pictures and video refers to the amount of information that can be seen slash stored by your camera sensor from the darkest part of the image to the brightest ones. Now, our eyes are incredible at this. They can retain all color and detail information from a bright midday sky to a dark shaded area in any scene. Cameras, however, struggle with this, and often information on either end is clipped, meaning that anything beyond those clipping points are simply stored as pure black or pure white. This is why, often in pictures, the bright blue sky you remember simply comes out as white, or your sky is nice and detailed, but your subject's really dark and not at all like you remember the scene. High-end cameras, however, and usually the bigger the sensor, the better, are actually able to capture more detail than your standard camera, even more than your phone's fancy HDR or high dynamic range mode that, to be fair, has really improved over recent years. And they can do this in one shot instead of mixing several. However, in order to access all of this information, you need to shoot it in RAW. Okay, okay, I know most of you already know this. Hold on, we're getting to the good part. What some of you might have not realized or never even thought of is that even when you shoot RAW, it still looks like it doesn't contain that much dynamic range because our monitors and screens are also quite limited in this aspect. But since all the information is there, we can use editing software to compress down all the information to a visible or rather displayable range. HDR screens might help with this in the future, but that's another topic altogether. So why is it that my A7S II has an incredible amount of details in the highlights and shadows in pictures but in video, it has as much latitude as my phone. That's because most cameras, including the A7, the A9, the FS5, the 1DX, the C100, all record video at 8 bits per channel, the same as what most screens can reproduce. In theory, this means that each pixel can store one of 16.7 million shades of color available in this bit depth. Since screens also display images at this same depth, what you see is what you get. Pictures, however, RAWs, can store 14 bits per channel giving us a total of a whopping 43 quintillion 980 quadrillion 465 trintillion trillion and the result is the ability to recover highlights and shadows in post i.e. to compress all that information down to 8 bits so unless we invent a camera that could literally capture a 14 bit raw picture 24 to 60 or whatever desired frames per second we cannot have the same latitude in video as we do in pictures except Oh wait, such cameras do exist, they just cost as much as a luxury car, and this is why. Anyways, back to our more plebe gear. Camera manufacturers have come up with a way to compress all those 14 bits of information your sensor can gather down to 8 bits, while still maintaining a gradable image that you can later adjust contrast in just the right places. We know this technology, method, technique, as log. I actually don't want to get too much into detail as to what log is and why or how it worked to achieve this. But in oversimplified terms, you can think of it as your camera applying a curve adjustment layer to your pictures that lower the contrast in a lot of the specific ways to again be able to store all the sensor's latitude in 8-bit space. Okay, that sounds great you might say. All the information without needing terabytes for a single clip? Sign me up! Hold on. There are some drawbacks. For one, compressing dynamic range like that doesn't give you all the promised results, and two, by compressing brightness values, you're losing a lot of the color richness you otherwise have. Again, 43 quintillion versus 16 million. But does that mean you get better color in non-log gammas? I don't know. Theoretically, that makes sense to me. While a 14-bit image doesn't necessarily contain 43 quintillion colors, it has room to store that much information. And whether your sensor can capture all of that, that's a different question, but since in the real world there are infinite number of colors, a digital representation of it has to sample them, compressing them in a way 
that you can still have a wide enough representation of real life. This is actually really complicated. We refer to the results of this overly complex process as your camera's color science. The real question is, is 8-bit space big enough to allow enough samples of colors such that after the rest have been derived in grading, the result is a pleasant image? Well, let's see if we can actually see a difference. On to the tests. Okay, so I stood outside my backyard holding the Spider Color Check at 24 and went through all the profiles that came standard with the A7S II and some that I changed to later. I exposed most of these for the shadowed areas, using the back of the color checker for the 18% gray and false colors within my small HD focus monitor to make sure I was within the correct range for the various gammas. This seemed like I ended up with the answers I wanted to, but that wasn't the case. Actually, I thought of postponing this video to run some more tests or just scraping it all together. But that was 2017 me. It's 2018, damn it. I'm not gonna be derailed by failure. So instead, we're gonna have a part two of this video at some point. No, wait, don't click away, not yet. Let's talk about why my testing method was flawed. Hopefully you'll learn something from this as well as the first five minutes that you already watched. Let's actually start going through my results, because at first, the flaws are not immediately apparent. Starting with no picture profile at all, I exposed this for the sunny area, and it's what you'd expect. You can see we're not clipping anywhere on the highlights, but our shadows are almost non-existent. Even if I try to erase them with various tools, there's just no information there. Skin tones are looking really good, actually, but a little flat, and in all honesty, it feels a little underexposed. There's no white point, and the roll off into the highlights here is rough, harsh. I don't know, it doesn't look good. Moving on to the next one. This is still exposed to the sun and still no picture profile, but I went into the creator profile and set it to neutral, plus lowered the contrast and saturation. This is helpful for some cameras like the A6000 that have no picture profiles. As you can see, you're actually getting a bit more detail in the shadows compared to the first clip. And overall, it just looks a little bit more natural. Here, I'm using the exact same settings, but exposing for the shadows. You can really see the highlights clipping, and though there is actually some color information up there, most of it is destroyed, and going from shadow to sunny area, skin tones are unusable. This is the type of scenario where you'd want to use log. Okay, moving to picture profiles. The first one is called still, and mm, it looks worse than using nothing. Shadows look worse, highlights look worse. Moving on. Picture profile two. Movie. Colors are actually desaturated here and the highlight roll-off seems a bit better, but nothing noticeable. Hmm. Picture profile 3. ITU 7 and 9 Color Gamut Pro. This is very contrasty and color saturated. Not meant to be graded at all. Here's where we first run into problems. The next picture profile is ITU 709 Color Gamut Matrix. Um, hmm. Program it looks better though. Look at the highlights. They look more natural. Matrix seems to compress colors more. But wait, wait, wait. Why? This is one of the major problems in this comparison. I'm not just comparing gammas. I'm trying to compare every gamma with every color gamut and come up with the best one. Keeping this in mind, I, later I tried to compare S-Log to CNA1 and CNA4 all using S gamut, but that's not fair. Part of the problem with the A7S is that S gamma is incomplete because of it's an 8-bit camera. So shouldn't I compare it across at least several gamuts? Furthermore, what actually made the biggest difference was the way I exposed things. I mentioned earlier that I was exposing to the gray in the back of the Spider Color Checker 24. The problem is, aside from S-Log, Cine gammas don't have an official exposure guide, at least not one that I could find, meaning I was going off values 45 and 40 IRE respectively, I believe, that I found on forums and such. Therefore, Cine 4 seemed like the better option at first, but the difference was basically undistinguishable when later I decided to expose to the right instead. To make things even more interesting, I can't say for sure I was setting my desired IRE values in the first place. The color checker happens to be a stop brighter when comparing it to this gray card I also have. Granted, the spider checker is probably the more accurate one, who knows what tool the people in the forums whose advice I was taking off were using. <sighs> the point is, I'm not comfortable sitting here and trying to draw conclusions from this data. Actually, you should be glad I'm not. If you are a Sony shooter, however, chances are 
you have already explored a lot of the picture profiles and options this camera has to offer. And if you haven't, I encourage you to do so, but probably not in a client shoot, do it on your own time. The truth is, there's very small differences in, in the Cine gammas, and S-Log is a completely different beast altogether. But you already know this. You should experiment things for yourself, and you should shoot in the picture profile that you like best. Another thing is that if you intend to grade the footage, I might suck at grading one gamma as opposed to another, and so your experience may vary greatly. And no one's opinion online should change your mind. Do what's most comfortable for you. One thing I did find is that despite 1600 being S-Log's native ISO, meaning the least amount of noise, it does produce a brighter image. Couple stops over the recommended exposure guide, actually, meaning that it is actually noisier. Most of the image is really clean, but it's a bit noisier. Just like a native ISO of 64 in the D850 is less noisy. Anyways, if you have any suggestions on how I should proceed with this test in the future when I decide to revisit this topic, let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, I hope you found something helpful in here. Thank you so much for watching and sticking through my crap. If you like this, wow, you're very supportive and or enjoyed watching me fail. Either way, hit the like button, get subscribed and share with your friends. Also, check the description for the links to products I featured today and I'll see you next time. Probably in the Neverland Geek Report, actually.